Thank you. All right, let's get into it. Um, so I don't have to tell anyone here how important coral reefs are. They support a really high biodiversity and biomass of organisms. They have a huge value for fisheries, especially in developed nations, and they bring in a whole lot of tourism dollars, apart, um, along with a, a bunch of other benefits. But when coral reefs are impacted by large disturbances such as um, bleaching or cyclone impacts, and we can see a decrease in the abundance of coral on a reef, and then a shift to this kind of more turfy forming seaweed. And if the rate of herbivory can't actually scale with the production of this algae, we can then see a further shift to this um, kind of canopy forming brown macroalgae, and this one here is sargassum. And each of these coral-dominated and macroalgae-dominated ecosystems are largely reinforced by their own set of processes. So moving between a coral-dominated state and a macroalgae-dominated state is particularly difficult. But importantly, once we've shifted to a macroalgae-dominated state, it can be really difficult to kind of break the feedbacks in that state and recover back to coral dominance. And that's why in so many places around the world, we've actually seen shifts from coral to macroalgae, but often we don't see a shift back to coral. And so this is my study species, my favorite macroalgae, sargassum. <laughs> it can grow up to three meters high and it forms really dense canopies. Um, and that means that it inhibits the settlement and recruitment of coral, and it also inhibits the, the growth of very present coral colonies. And because sargassum is so common on so many degraded and inshore reefs worldwide, there's been a lot of research investigating herbivory of sargassum. And this research has identified different fish species that will uh, browse on the sargassum, and particularly this one here is Nasa unicornis, which if you put a bit of seaweed out on the reef where there's nasos around, they'll just go and smash it, they love it. And since there are so many of these fish that will eat the sargassum, what kind of ask leads us to ask, well, why is sargassum common on so many reefs then if there are these fish that remove it? And I think it largely has to do with the processes within the seaweed beds that are actually reinforcing its dominance. So before I go any further, I need to uh, go through a little terminology that I'll be using for you non-seaweed people in the room. Um, if I refer to the thallus, that just means the whole algae, the whole thing. The blades are kind of like leaves, the stipe is like the stem kind of, and the whole fast is the anchor of the algae. And importantly, uh, seaweeds or algae don't take up nutrients through the whole fast like do the roots of plants. And sargassum reproduces through the release of negatively buoyant propagules. And research from temperate systems actually shows that these propagules can settle within just a couple of meters of the parent, so they really don't go far. And they settle to the benthos within the EAM, and then they can rapidly grow. And we don't really know much about the herbivores that might be removing these propagules once they've settled within the EAM, and I'll get to that a little bit later. So that sounds also really cool, I think, because it has this really strong seasonal cycle. So in summer, it has its apex biomass, which can be a few metres tall before it reproduces, and then it will senesce or degrade until it just persists as a whole fast and maybe one or two primary axes throughout winter before in the spring-summer period it will rapidly regrow to its apex biomass and height once again. So this brings me to the objective of my thesis, which was to investigate the mechanisms underlying the continued dominance of sargassum on so many inshore and degraded coral reefs. And I do this in five data chapters, with my first chapter largely serving as an introduction to the rest of my chapters where I look at the change in coral and sargassum communities after repeated disturbances on an inshore coral reef using benthic monitoring data. In chapter two, I then experimentally investigate the capacity for sargassum to recover after disturbance. In chapter three, I investigate the susceptibility of sargassum holdfasts to herbivory and also their capacity for regrowth from damaged holdfasts, also from a fish bite maybe. And then in chapter four, I investigate a bit of, of, of propagules. So asking, once these propagules settle on the bottom, are rates of grazing by fishes actually affected by this presence of these sargassum propagules? Do they notice if they're there? And then in chapter five, I look at the, the survival of sargassum propagules within different microhabitats, so within crevices versus exposed areas. And my thesis is largely divided into what happens within sargassum communities 
and then looking at the contribution of holdfasts to uh, the Sargassum community, um, in, including herbivory of holdfasts, and then also looking at herbivory of propagules to determine what kind of contribution propagules might have. So let's get into it. Chapter one is called The Contrasting Response of Coral and Sargassum Communities to Frequent Disturbance. So we know a lot about how disturbances like cyclones affect coral communities. So a, a cyclone going through will smash all of the corals and recovery of the coral colonies will largely be from uh, surviving fragments or from little recruits coming in to the reef. But we know a lot less about how disturbance affects macroalgae, specifically sargassum. So once it goes through, how does the sargassum actually recover and how quickly does it recover? And this is really important when we're considering that these uh, sargassum and coral can kind of be competitors in the same area of reef. And previous studies have suggested that large storms or cyclones that come through ripping the macroalgae off the reef in kind of one fell swoop actually provides a window of opportunity for the recovery of coral populations, for them to settle and grow in the absence of this macroalgae. But of course, that will largely depend on how quickly sargassum can actually come back after disturbance. So I was fortunate enough to be able to use some benthic monitoring data from the Turtle Group, which is just here in the northern Great Barrier Reef. The Turtle Group is about 30 kilometres inshore of Lizard Island and about 10 kilometres off the Australian mainland. And throughout the period of this benthic monitoring data, there have been frequent disturbances impacting the Turtle Group. And this um, gave me a really good opportunity to investigate the effects of this disturbance on sargassum communities and coral communities on these reefs. So in two, I have um, benthic monitoring data from 2013, starting with 2013. And in 2014, cyclone ITA crossed the turtle group as a category three to four cyclone. And in the next year, cyclone Nathan crossed the turtle group and kind of twizzled around out there for a while. And then the poor turtle group in 2016, it was affected by the mass coral bleaching, where in the northern Great Barrier Reef, over 60% of corals um, died. So this presented a really nice opportunity to look at how the sargassum reef coral was affected by these disturbances. <clears throat> so the aim of my first chapter is to investigate how frequent disturbance alters the coral and sargassum communities on an inshore coral reef. So this is the turtle group, and since 2013, five sites were monitored using benthic monitoring um, point intercept transects, and one site was monitored since 2014, but these were all pre-disturbances. Now, for this, um, the more exposed sites here were dominated by macroalgae. So these here are two different species of macroalgae, but um, they were both um, really high cover on these exposed sites. In contrast, in the more sheltered sites, they had beautiful coral-dominated communities. So some of these uh, coral had over 40 to 50% cover, which is quite high, for, especially for an intro uh, coral reef. And these pictures were actually taken in the turtle group. <clears throat> so I'm going to present here um, data from just two sites. So this top one here is data from the exposed site, so initially sargassum dominated. This bottom one here is uh, data from the sheltered site, so initially coral dominated. And I've got percent cover on the y-axis and I've got the uh, three disturbances that impacted along with the years. So, the first thing that we notice is that in green, we've got sargassum here, and initially it was about 80% cover on these reefs. And after the first cyclone went through, sargassum cover actually decreased to 0%, so it wasn't seen at the site at all. And instead, there was a takeover of this algae, which is called halicorn, which hadn't really been seen before and really hasn't been seen again since. But essentially, this lake was wiped clean of sargassum. But and sargassum recovered to within 10 to 15% of its original bio biomass within two years of this initial disturbance that affected it so severely. And then when we look at the coral community, initially coral cover was over 40% here and sargassum was absent at this site. And as you'd expect, as we know, a cyclone going through uh, reduced the coral cover to between zero and 5%, um, which is what we see here. But Really cool, the sargassum has actually um, started. What? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the sargassum has actually started taking over this site. So, 
Um, it was 0% cover in 2050, and by 2017, it was about 30% cover. And he's actually going back in a couple of weeks to resurvey these sites, and it'll be really interesting to see if Sargassum has just kind of zooped back up here and it's really taken into this site. But we can really see the contrasting effects um, or the contrasting resilience of these two, um, the Sargassum and the coral, to these disturbances. <clears throat> so I was really interested in why Sargassum was able to so rapidly recover when it seemed like it had been gone from the site. And then in even increase its range so quickly into a site where it hadn't been seen before. And Engelin et al. studied a similar uh, hurricane in the Caribbean in uh, Sargassum beds, and they suggested that it was largely, or recovery of Sargassum was largely because of regrowth from holdfasts and also the reproductive capacity of the Sargassum, so spread of propagules. And I'm going to be addressing uh, regrowth from holdfasts in chapters two and three of my thesis, and then I'm going to be looking at um, herbivory of propagules in chapters four and five. Alrighty, so let's get into chapter two, where I look at the capacity for sargassum to recover after disturbance experimentally. Um, this one is called Canopy Forming Macroalgal Beds on Coral Reefs Are Resilient to Physical Disturbance, and was published um, earlier this year. So wave action from large storms or cyclones has been reported to remove most sargassum biomass from the benthos. But these studies have also reported that often holdfasts are left behind. And this makes sense because sargassum had these kind of flexible stipes where it's really easy for the stipe to break, leaving the holdfast intact. And we saw this from um, the, my first chapter where the sargassum seemed to recover really fast. And if holdfasts are left and they can perhaps recover really fast from holdfasts, this might be why. So the aim of this chapter was to examine the contribution of holdfasts and also propagules to sargassum biomass after disturbance. Um, I did this experiment at Orpheus Island and I created 1.5 by 1.5 metre plots on the benthos. And within each of these plots, I had uh, one of three treatments. So either I trimmed the sargassum, uh, leaving the holdfast intact on the benthos and removing most of the biomass, or I completely removed it using like a chisel to scrape off the holdfast from the bottom, or I had control plots where I did nothing. Now, I started my clearances in um, May 2015, so this was just before the uh, kind of natural senescence of the sargassum, and I did my subsequent measurements over the spring-summer regrowth period of the sargassum. Alrighty, what did I find? So I used linear mix effects models to analyse the change in holdfasts through time, um, so density of the sargassum essentially, and what we see here is this is in the removed plot where I completely removed the holdfasts. Initially, there were none in May, straight up with the clearance, um, which makes sense because I removed them all. But then we see really fast um, recovery of the density. And this is likely because of the contribution of new recruits that were probably microscopic on the benthos when I was removing all of the adults. <clears throat> but they didn't recover to the same density as the adults, which I guess also makes sense. Uh, and then when we're looking at changes in canopy height within each of these treatments, the control here, I'll just point out, um, it's senesced, so that's why it decreases in height here. And then, really cool, the control and trimmed treatments, so the ones where I just cut it off, leaving the hold fast, actually tracked each other perfectly in the growing season. So uh, the salagasm didn't care at all that I had trimmed off all of the biomass, just leaving the hold fast on the bottom. It seemed to not affect it. Um, and the recovery of the uh, height from the recruits, it didn't quite get to the same height as the adults, which makes sense again because they're little babies. Um, and then when I combined the height and the density to get an estimate of biomass, what I want to just focus on here is that compared to the control and trimmed treatments, the removed plot where I had removed all of the whole fast had about 50% of the biomass of the control and trimmed treatments, indicating that uh, if I removed the whole fast in a plot, it reduced the biomass of the sargassum by about 50%. So, in conclusion, it seems that regrowth from whole fasts allows sargassum to really rapidly recover its biomass. Um, but propagules can also contribute pretty significantly to recovery. Um, and if we wanted to remove, uh, remove, reduce the sargassum biomass, we have to remove these whole fasts. And that brings me to chapter three, investigating the susceptibility of sargassum holdfasts to herbivory, and then also looking at their capacity for regrowth from damaged holdfasts. 
Um, this one's called Hold Fast of Sargassum Sportsii are uh, resistant to herbivory and resilient to damage and was just published last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, there have been a lot of studies investigating herbivory of Sargassum and these studies will generally put out a Sargassum assay on the reef for between three to eight hours maybe and look at the fish that remove most of the Sargassum biomass. But we all know now that Sargassum reef grows really well from its whole casts, but we don't really know if any fish might um, remove or target these Sargassum whole fasts, removing them from the denver. So that's what I wanted to investigate in this chapter. So I had two experiments within this chapter. The first one was to investigate herbivory of entire Sargassum phthalate, but paying particular attention to the whole fast. And then I wanted to investigate the resilience of Sargassum whole fasts to damage, so from a, a bite from a fish, for example. I did this in the turtle group and at Lizard Island, um, collecting assays from the turtle group and transporting them to Lizard Island. So my assays were uh, 16 exposed rocks where I had attached sargassum on the rocks. And each of these rocks had between one to five whole fasts, which meant that I had 53 whole fasts in total, or 53 individual uh, sargassum phthalai. Uh, I also had caged rocks to control for the effects of handling. And each of these rocks were about 15 to 20 centimetres in diameter, about yay big. And because I got them from dense uh, sargassum stands in the turtle group, they didn't have any fish bites or anything on them uh, at the start of the experiment. I deployed these at two sites on the reef crest for 24 days, three and a half weeks, and I filmed for three and a half hours per day for the first three days, and then once every two to three days thereafter, which equaled uh, 450 hours of video and a significant portion of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so this is one of the rocks on day four. So they hadn't been out very long, there were still 20 days to go. And we can see here that the, there are a lot of white feeding scars, so there's been pretty high grazing on this rock. And most of the sargassum biomass has been removed, but we see, still see partial stipes here, and all of the whole fasts are still there. And when we look at the uh, mean number of bites, this is the mean number of bites in three and a half hours, we can see that in the first two days, bites on the sargassum were really high, and then interest seemed to rapidly decline, and you kind of think, well, okay, the sargassum has been completely removed after two days, but no. So these pictures illustrate it really well. This is on day one, one of my assays before, just when I put it out, and you can see there's heaps of tasty leafy biomass on there. And this is the end of day two, so it's a little hard to see, but you can kind of see all of these stipes are still left. Um, so it really seemed like these fishes were targeting the leafy biomass and the stipes didn't seem to be particularly interesting for them. And uh, when we're looking at the fish species that bit on these assays, we've got sargassum here, and unsurprisingly, like most studies have shown, Naso unicornis, uh, which is this fish uh, here, uh, predominantly bit on these sargassum, as well as a little bit of uh, bites from Saganus doliatus, but these guys are generally leaf nibblers, and they don't really do much in the way of removing this thought. But then, when we look at grazing on the rocks, which is what I was really interested in, we can see that a lot of these fishes are actually algal croppers, so they probably don't have a jaw morphology to actually remove a whole fast from the bottom. Um, these parrotfish here, uh, which is the Scarus and Chlorura species, they probably do have the whole fast jaw, uh, like the, the jaw morphology to remove the whole fast, but they probably don't have the interest and they target different things than uh, brown macroalgae. So if I did some kind of back of the envelope calculations to look at uh, feeding rates on these rocks, on average there were 10 bites per rock per hour. And if we assume an eight hour feeding day, I had the rocks out there for 24 days, that means that there were about 2,000 bites per rock on a rock that was about this big, which seems like a really high feeding rate. So, how many of my 53 whole fasts were removed in the 24 days? Just one. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't capture it on video. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it really seems that these herbivores are avoiding the whole fast. They're really, there doesn't seem to be any kind of fish that sees a tasty whole fast and goes for it and starts nibbling at it because these whole fasts, these exposed whole fasts, didn't actually decrease in size relative to control either, so they didn't get small around the edges with like a little disc in there. So it seems like no one particularly likes whole fasts. And this experiment doesn't really make much sense in light of that finding, but I started them at the same time, so I'm going to present my results. Um, but I thought, okay, well, 
the rocks were out for three and a half weeks, and over longer time scales, probably accidental bites are going to accumulate on these hold fasts. So I still wanted to know how much of a hold fast has to be removed before it can't regrow, because we know that cycasin can regrow from intact hold fasts. So in order to do this, I went to the turtle group and I chose this middle turtle reef and I chose six discrete four square metre patches along the edge of this reef just here. And they were uh, consolidated substratum, they looked like dead parietes bonnies. And within each of these patches, I cut off the sargassum above the uh, hold fast. So here's one hold fast here. And then I inflicted one of four levels of damage. So um, I either removed 75% of the hold fast, just cutting through with a, with a Stanley knife and kind of flicking it off, 50%, um, 25% or none. Um, so this one here, you can see I removed 50% of the hold fast. And then I went back after a year. And after a year, this here's the, the hold fast there. I quantified the mortality of the individual, uh, the height of the regrown phalli, and I also looked at change in hold fast diameter. Um, I'm only going to present these first two today, just in the interest of time. <clears throat> I used Bayesian generalized linear mix effects models to analyze differences in um, treatments. And this here is percent mortality plus or minus 95% credible intervals. So the thing with the credible intervals is that um, overlapping credible intervals doesn't necessarily imply non-significance. Anyway, what did I find? So only the three quarters removed treatment had significantly higher mortality than controls, which is pretty cool. And there were about 60% mortality in this treatment. But that still means that 40% of these hold fasts actually regrew their, regrew their, their phalli, which is amazing. And so I thought, well, okay, well, these three quarters removed hold fasts, were they short little stubby things struggling to survive? Um, so when I looked at the height of the phalli, well, no, they didn't. They, didn't. <laughs> they grew back and they, they seemed fine, they seemed happy. I don't know why. So, in conclusion, <laughs> if you take one thing from the talk is that sargassum and zombies, I've kind of thrown it out all around Twitter that I, I think it's quite cool, that sargassum has such a large capacity for regrowth, even from small pieces. And removal of three quarters of the hold fast increased, resulted in increased mortality, but not even um, removal of half the hold fast means they didn't care. But herbivores don't target hold fast. That's kind of the crux of the argument here. And it got me thinking that, well, maybe the whole fasts don't actually have to be removed. So maybe high rates of browsing can be enough to cause mortality of the whole fast without direct removal. So there hasn't really been much research on this, but the one I could find was by Gomez and Westermeer from 1992, where they, every two weeks, they clipped off the fronds of this red algae here. And after one year, the whole fast was unable to produce fronds anymore. So maybe that could be a mechanism by which we could um, cause cytosine to completely um, kind of leave a reef is by just continuous browsing of it. So we know a lot of, bit more about, well, the lack of herbivory of whole fast now, but we still don't know anything about uh, herbivory properties. So let's go have a look at that. So chapter four is looking at whether rates of grazing are affected by the presence of sargassum propagules. This one is called the presence of macroalgal propagules decreases grazing rates from a coral reef. That's a bit of a spoiler. So areas of high grazing intensity, whether we're talking about coral reefs or savannas, uh, create these grazing lawns. And a grazing lawn is an area of really short vegetation that has a really high productivity and can support quite a high biomass of grazers. And in order to maintain these grazing lawns, grazers are assumed to remove the seedlings or the propagules of larger species that are growing in the lawn, preventing them from establishing. And you can see this really well in caging or fencing studies on land. So this here is a fence and you can kind of see where all the herbivores have been eating and where they've been, where they can't get into. So there's long grass here and these kind of shrubs all around here as well, showing that they have to have removed all of these larger species in order to maintain this grazing lawn. And this has also been demonstrated on coral reefs. So Hughes and others uh, did a study on Orpheus Island where they caged areas of the reef crest for two and a half years. And initially it was a, a, a grazing lawn, but after the two and a half years, Sargassum had established within all of these cages essentially showing that these fishes had to have been removing these sargassum, um, preventing them from establishing before they put in the cages. 
but we don't really know anything about the fissures that might be removing these propagules. So the aims for this chapter were firstly to identify the fissures responsible for propagule removal, and then also to determine if the presence of side acid propagules actually changes grazing rates on the EAM. So do the fish notice if they're there? <clears throat> so to do this, I put 38 settlement tiles in a 1,000 litre aquarium. So I've got this here, and this was conducted at Lizard Island. I put a further 38 tiles into an aquarium that had no side acid because I essentially needed to make comparable grazing surfaces, one that had side acid propagules and one that didn't. So in order to get the side acid propagules, I went to the, uh, the turtle group and collected reproductive side acid, and then I had to figure out how to get the propagules from the side acid. So um, I tried a number of methods before this experiment started. Uh, so first I tried desiccating the side acid, as had been done by Diaz Plino and the cook. And I also tried hot and cold shots, so where I heated sargassum up by three degrees overnight, or I put it in a really cold bath. And this was, um, I think it was about nine degrees, say seawater. But all of these stresses actually worked really well, and sargassum got real stressed and released the propagules for me. <laughs> all right. So I cultured these tiles once I'd got my sargassum propagules for 10 days in these flow through aquaria on Lizard. And once they, uh, I left them in there for the 10 days so that the propagules would have time to firmly attach to the tiles. And then I caged all of my tiles, propagule tiles and the tiles that just had the ecolithic algal matrix on them. And I put them on the reef for three weeks to kind of get a early stage EAM community um, without a bivory. So uh, this here is a tile after the three week period on the reef. And then I quantified propagule density on the tiles that did have propagules using these Kit little one centimeter square quadrats um, and using microscopes. I then paired my uh, so EAM, so the epileptic algal matrix, and my propagules mixed with EAM tiles and put them out on the reef. So this is an example of one of my pairs. And I deployed these on both the reef crest and the reef flat for six days, and half of my pairs were caged and half of my pairs were exposed to herbivores. I filmed them for three hours per day, um, over five days, um, which gave me 240 hours of video to watch. And I recorded the number of bites, the bite location, so which tile it was on, and the fish species that were uh, doing the biting. Okay, so I analyzed these using Bayesian generalized linear mixed effects models. And remember that overlapping of credible intervals doesn't imply no significance. It's gonna be important here in a minute. Um, this here is uh, average bites per hour, plus or minus the 95% credible intervals um, on the reef crest, the reef flat, and at my two sides, third and south. So what we found here is that at each site within the reef crest and the reef flat, bites on tiles that didn't have side acid propagules were significantly higher than bites on tiles that had propagules mixed in. If you don't believe me, I did plan contrasts, or plan comparisons, and essentially this just, um, if this dot here is in the, on the, in the positive side, it means that there were more bites on the tiles that didn't have propagules. And any, if this line here doesn't cross zero, doesn't cross the dotted line, it kind of implies significance. So it looks like there were more bites on the tiles that didn't have propagules, which is really cool. And then when I was looking at which fish species were doing most of the biting in these tiles, it was predominantly Xenia stictus, this little bloody here, who uh, was taking most bites on the propagule uh, and the non propagule tiles. And there really were very little contribution from other fish species. So um, this parrotfish, Scarish Schlegelite, took some bites on the reef crest. Um, Tinochetus striatus, the surgeon fish, also took a few bites. But largely, I think it was due to this bloody. And when I looked at survival of propagules, just on the tiles that had propagules on them, I saw that the um, survival of propagules was significantly lower on the reef crest, which kind of makes sense because the rates of herbivory on the reef crest were significantly higher than on the reef flat. So in conclusion, it seems like these grazing fishes do notice if cytas and propagules have settled within the EAM, and they might prefer to bite on areas of the EAM free of these cytas and propagules. But rather than these large bodied herbivores, it might actually be due to these little blennies that are removing these kind of propagules on the reef. And this could potentially present another positive feedback within sargassum beds. So 
So we know that the propagules settle within the parent, within like a couple of meters of the parent plant. And if we have high densities of these propagules near the parents, and the fish don't really like to feed on these areas, it could kind of uh, enhance the survival of these propagules and kind of enhancing the proliferation of the sargassum bed. And it would be really interesting to actually um, investigate this. So for my last chapter, I wanted to look at survival of sargassum propagules within crevices versus exposed areas. Because the tiles I used in this last experiment were flat, and the reef is, you know, got all sorts of nooks and crannies in it. So this chapter is called Microhabitats, Enhanced Recruitment and Survival, but Inhibit Growth, growth of Propagules of the Tropical Microalga Sargassum Sportia. Um, and it's under review at the minute. So it's a generally recognised ecological principle that organisms can gain refuge from either harsh physiological conditions or predation within refuges. So I've got this little mouse hiding in this little crack. And this here is um, a study from Randall and others that showed that um, the number of coral recruits, but also these little turbinary recruits, were significantly higher in crevices on the reef than in exposed areas. But Especially for plants and algae, settling within a crevice might have consequences for growth. <coughs> and the importance of these refuges might depend on the rates of predation or rates of herbivory. So if rates of um, herbivory are pretty low, then settling within a crevice where you might not be getting as much sunlight probably isn't such an advantage. So this is what I wanted to look at for my last chapter, to determine how microhabitats affect the recruitment, growth, and survival of early post-settlement sargassum propagules. I once again collected reproductive sargassum from the turtle group and induced it to release propagules in a tank containing 48 sediment tiles. Now, each of these tiles had crevices along their length, so um, for the rest of this uh, section of the talk, I'm going to be referring to exposed areas, which are these areas between the crevices, and also the crevices, which are obviously crevices. <laughs> <laughs> um, I cultured these tiles in a flow-through system and quantified propagule density and also height after 18 days. And I used um, these Bayesian generalized linear mixed effects models once again to analyze the density of the propagules and also the height of the propagules within crevices and exposed areas. And we can see that whilst the density in crevices was higher, the height of the propagules, even after just 18 days post-settlement, was significantly lower, indicating that there might be a bit of a trade-off of settling within a crevice when there's no river. I then took these tiles and deployed them on the reef crest and the reef flat at Lizard for five days, and I had six exposed and six caged tiles at site. I filmed four tiles, um, because I only had enough cameras to film four, uh, per site for three hours per day, which was another 240 hours of video. And I recorded the number of bites, uh, the bite locations, so whether they were biting in a crevice or an exposed surface, and also the fish species. And once again, I found that Xenia stictus was taking most bites on these tiles. Now, this here is mean bites per hour per square centimetre, taking into account the relative difference in the area of the crevices versus the exposed area on the tiles. And there really were very little contribution from any other species, particularly when we're thinking about the larger body grazers um, that I would that I assumed would have been biting these tiles. <clears throat> so I'm going to now present the survival of the propagules, um, portion of initial propagules remaining. Um, it's going to be on the reef crest and flat, and then I've got my two treatments here: caged, uncaged, and then my surfaces, the crevice, uh, crevice or exposed. So on the reef flat, if we just look at the uncaged area here, <coughs> we can see that there was no real difference in survival of the propagules in a crevice versus in an exposed area. But in contrast, on the reef crest, we saw a big difference in survival, where there was really low survival of these propagules on the exposed areas, indicating that settling within a crevice is probably going to be an advantage um, in areas of high degree. So in conclusion, Crevices can protect early post-settlement propagules from herbivory, but there might also be a trade-off where growth at this stage is slower, and that means that they'll be subject to smaller predators for longer. And the benefits might depend on rates of herbivory, as I just said. Um, and once again, we really saw minimal contribution from large body herbivores. So in conclusion for my thesis, um, I found that sargassum is amazingly, extremely resilient to disturbance. 
and it has a really high capacity for regrowth from whole fast, even from little pieces of whole fast. Um, herbivorous fishes don't target and seemingly avoid whole fast, at least these shorter time scales, but browsing might end up causing mortality of the whole fast. I found that the spread of sargassum through reproduction is likely going to be enhanced through either the property of settling within crevices, but also lower grazing rates on EAM containing sargassum property. And I guess overall, if we're thinking about the sum of my findings, if there is any kind of window of opportunity for the recovery of coral populations after disturbance, I think that's going to be a very small window. It might be shut. Like, <laughs> it kind of seems like disturbance really seems to favour sargassum. And it's been suggested that sargassum is kind of well adapted to both high and low frequency disturbance. And when we're investigating herbivory, it's really important to consider not only the ecology and biology of the fish that are biting on the seaweed, but also the ecology and biology of the macroalgae. Because there have been so many studies looking at feeding on sargassum, but we haven't really investigated who might completely remove the sargassum from the reef. We could also revisit the traditional assumption that large body grazers are predominantly responsible for poverty removal and maybe see how much the world really is playing. And in the future, with um, disturbance frequency predicted to uh, increase and become uh, more severe, I think it's likely that we might be seeing more sargassum on reefs just because it seems so resilient to these kinds of disturbances. Um, like most PhDs, I think this has brought up more questions than I've actually managed to answer. And I think I'd be a, a couple of questions that would be really cool to answer in the future. Namely, if chronic browsing actually does cause uh, mortality of these sargassum whole fasts without direct removal. Um, which fishes might remove sargassum propagules as they grow, because learning can't do heavy lifting forever. And also, if survival of sargassum propagules actually is enhanced adjacent to sargassum stands. Um, I've published two of my chapters, um, one is under review and the other one is in prep that I'll hopefully be submitting soon. Um, I've been involved in a couple of other publications throughout my PhD as well. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank the, the funding organisations that allowed me to conduct this research, um, particularly the Ian Potter Foundation, um, the Holdsworth Wildlife Research Endowment, the Australian Coral Reef Society and the Centre for Supporting You. Um, there's no way that I can thank Andy Coe enough for supporting me throughout my PhD and trying to craft me into a proper scientist. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Morgan, for supporting me throughout all these years. Um, thank you very much to all my volunteers who literally spent days and days on microscopes counting tiny, tiny coffee fields. Um, especially Joel, who came with me on all of my field trips for some reason. And, <laughs> and without him, I wouldn't have been able to find my sargassum plots again because I have absolutely no sense of direction on <laughs> And thank you all for coming and listening.